Hi, Lynn. Hi, Rihanna. How do you settle arguments or long-term grudges? Well, the silent treatment is my specialty. And then once I get over the silent treatment and I calm down and I've had time to sort of reflect on my own position, I then gently introduce the issue at hand. My husband and I, we discuss it. We work through it. Now, once upon a time, not that long ago, I was the queen of the grudge. And okay, look, I still have certain grudges. I'm not going to lie. There are still people that I pass by on the street and I pretend that I don't either A, see them or B, know them. So I am not truly reformed, but I am in the process of trying to do and be better. Wow. That's very diplomatic of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's called personal growth and uh, I'm still working on it. (laughs) Well, if you wanted to go a way that's not the silent treatment, that's a, a little less subtle. If you were a politician in territorial Tallahassee. Oh, bring on the duel. You you would oh, have the option down. of just challenging someone to a duel. There were rules to the duels. You knew going into it whether this was like a duel to the death or like just kind of shoot away from some of the vital organs. So, oh, oh, wait, you could establish that early on. Hey, we're, one of us is going to die on this one or like, OK, I'll just shoot you in like the leg. Yeah. Word. Yeah. Oh. Be like, look, just just aim for like the lower, like aim for something that I'm not really going to like rely on. You'd say, hey, let's go out to somewhere where the the jurisdiction was a little, you know, like a gray area, like sort of somewhere in between Georgia and Florida. <laughs> this is real. Southern gentlemen protecting their honor with guns or knives. Or swords. Possibly to the death or possibly just grievous harm. At a time when antibiotics weren't that prevalent. There is like a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson about Tallahassee being like a grotesque place of land speculators and desperados. We were the wild, wild east. We were. It was crazy. There was drinking and gambling and and shooting each other. And it was was a lot of politicians doing it. Those were our representatives. Okay, this sounds strangely, you know, I mean, we're we're still a place of a lot of drinking. So what's really the difference between then and now? A lot of that still exists within our culture around honor, around, you know, personal reputation, right? We talk about, you know, if you don't do as you say and say as you do, All you have is your name. And when your name is mud, you don't have any sort of capital to stand on. This week, we looked at the political divides of the past to better appreciate the ways in which we've learned to solve at least some of them. This is all about hubris, right? There's this idea that If you're not willing to go out and fight, you know, let's take it out into the street, then then you're somehow a coward or dishonorable because you're not willing to fight for what you believe in. Stephanie is a tour guide for Storied Paths here in Tallahassee, and it's on those tours standing in the heart of downtown that she details this political drama that took place in Leon County around the election of 1839. The two dominant political parties of the time, the Democrats and the Whigs, had grown ever more partisan as economic conditions in the state became more and more unfavorable. But fear not, this race is not characterized by economic policy. Instead, as the election nears, it escalates from something political to something personal and bitter driven by these aggressive personalities, one of which is a Democrat named Lee Reed. It's Reed who would kick off a series of events that would eventually lead to a shotgun pointed at his back. Spoiler alert, he doesn't survive that. As they were heading up to the election of that year, there was a lot of personal attacks. During a campaign event out in St. Mark's, Reed gave a speech that levied a bunch of accusations and insults at a certain member of the Whigs, 
and that member responded by demanding an apology, and when he didn't get it, he challenged Reed to a duel. Reed, in the beginning, um, did not accept that duel, uh, which, you know, for the time period, it was a dishonorable thing to not take part in something like that. There was no de-escalating this situation once it started, and certainly not from the Whigs, who began to put up public notices disparaging Reed. They were taunting him. They were hanging up these placards, these signs that were accusing each other of, you know, being horrible human beings, and it got very personal. One placard would pronounce Reed a coward and a scoundrel. Another placard would describe him as base enough to do an act of injustice and mean enough to skulk from the consequences. Eventually, Reed would challenge one of these agitators to a duel, a Whig named Augustus Alston. On December 12, 1839, Alston and Reed would take up their rifles and meet at the Florida-Georgia line. And they met here because dueling is illegal. It was against the law, which we'll get back to. So when Reed and Alston finally duel, uh, you know, there's there's this whole build up politically where they're angry at each other, they're publicly shaming each other, putting up these placards, and then they do finally duel. The terms of the duel are already set. It is a duel to the death. Alston and Reed stand back to back 15 paces apart. And when they get the cue to turn around and shoot, Alston slips and lands on his back, where Reed simply points his rifle at Alston's heart and takes his life. It's really this political um, mess, but it's also really rooted in the culture at the time. Contrary to what our modern sensibilities would suggest, this duel raised Reed's political profile massively. It also put a target on his back because Augustus Alston had a brother named Willis Alston, and he was out for revenge. Willis would make his way to Tallahassee, to the hotel that stood across from the Capitol. It was a busy legislative session, and camouflaged by that crowd was Willis, who fired on Reed in a restaurant, fled the scene, came back, stabbed Reed, fled again, and Reed would survive this. Uh, granted, he would become a lot more paranoid. Reed has to uh, arm himself. This kind of a gang of politicians who are protecting Reed. This posse of friends that walk around between the Capitol and the courthouse where they're doing business every day. Reed had a good reason to be paranoid. Willis Alston would stay in Tallahassee for the next year, biding his time until the inevitable would happen. He hides himself in a hole in a house on Monroe Street and then jumps out after Reed passed by and shoots him in the back. So it takes 18 months for that whole scenario to play out. I mean, it was very public, you know, the public shaming with the placards being nailed trees and the shooting of Reed on Monroe Street. People of Tallahassee are watching this play out and not wanting to live in that type of place. They were going to put forth new legislation and anti another anti-dueling law. This anti-dueling bill would not pass. Samuel Sibley, who was an editor for a local newspaper at the time, called it the most ridiculous tissue of crudities and fudgeries ever sanctioned by a grave legislative body. Sibley was not convinced that a law to deter dueling could itself change a culture that condoned dueling. In Sibley's words, preventatives can only be found in the moral influence of enlightened public opinion. That is the only corrective. Because for those who uphold dueling, laws are, of course, useless. Gosh, so deeply connected where we are right now, right? Like, there, there are some real cultural divisions. You know, I mean, you can really see kind of reflections of similar things that we are going through today. And 
um, this is one of the reasons I really love history, love to do my tours is because there is so much to be learned from the past, right? Thanks for listening to Speaking Of, the Unbothered Edition from WFSU Public Media. New episodes drop every Thursday, and you can find them wherever you get your podcasts. Speaking Of is produced with support from PRX and is made possible in part by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation.